All right, guys, welcome to the Codex Cantina. I had some audio issues, never kind of experienced that before, so we're gonna refilm this intro in my usual spot. We're doing a library tour today. Normally, most people, I think, when they think of what I read, they just think I read literary fiction and, and classics, and that's about it. Not much could be further from the truth. While those are my favorite, and while those are the main things that I read nowadays, I have a long heritage history and still pastime where uh, when I read so much literary fiction, sometimes I need a little bit of a release, and I find a lot of release in some of my genre fiction and some of my light novels. I read a lot of comics, too. So what I thought we'd do, uh, we don't do a lot of comics and stuff like that on this channel because just haven't figured out how to work it in. Uh, so let's do a tour of the library, the Una Personal Library. You'll get to see probably 70-75% of it, about 25% is still locked up imprisoned in my garage. I have not liberated it from our move, and uh, there's going to be two shelves. Uh, one shelf will be the other, probably 25% of my library, and the other is my wife's, which is also uh, locked up and needing to be rebuilt because we sold a lot of her books uh, before the move because books are a pain in the butt to move. So with that said, guys, apologize for the audio. You're going to miss a little bit of the manga tour in the beginning. Uh, you know, You don't miss too much besides Big's box sets, you know, Full Metal Alchemist, all three One Piece, stuff like that. But uh, let's jump into the tour and have some fun. All right, so I did not really do any organizing or preparation for this, but I do have uh, not very many poetry, but this is one of the few ones that I do have, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, a uh, classic piece here. But what you'll see is mostly I've got a couple of kind of like young adult Star Wars here in terms of like the Lost Stars you know, before The Awakening, back when, you know, the J.J. Abrams' first film was coming out. I got a couple of my manga over here in terms of, this is my Junji Ito collection. Really enjoyed Uzumaki. Gyo was like the biggest left down in my life. And uh, Tomi was pretty solid too. Really, really enjoyed those. Now, if you guys haven't heard of Chu, this is something you're going to want to go out of your way to check out from the library by, by John Lehman and Rob Guillory. These two just have a fantastic, cohesive ability to really bring a very funny story and it's actually really it's got a very unique art style to it but it's uh basically <laughs> it's this this detective it's a food detective so whenever he eats something he kind of sees everything that the food passed uh, the, the, the past of the food everything the food's gone through from how it's been prepared how it got cut up stuff like that and there's just tons of food superpowers where when they eat this type of food it gives them this type of a power and uh, when you consume someone else that um, has maybe had that power, you consume that power as well. So obviously you can see some themes of that from going all the way back to some uh, Greek mythology days. Um, and even I've seen that kind of in like some more recent runs of uh, Bacchano, if you're into that light series. Uh, there's been some, some concepts of uh, consuming someone else to gain their knowledge is, is an old tactic. Um, and what you're going to have on these two shelves over here are just hodgepodges of uh, just chess books. I, I, play, I used to play a lot of chess, don't really play anymore. Something about sitting there and having your heart beating really, really fast gets to me, which is maybe why I like reading books too. Over here again, I got some more end game and uh, opening chess books. I tend to focus most of my time on the opening when I was studying it. This book's really cool. This is like the art book from Tokyo Ghoul. My wife bought this for me one year for Christmas. And it's got all of the art and it'll have like kind of like little stories behind maybe how he came up with the idea of it and such. Really cool little piece. I really enjoyed this work specifically. Coming over to this section, you are entering kind of like the Marvel comic book section of this. You will see that I, I obviously, I have a lot of the JLAs mostly because uh, I really like Morrison. I think he's a good writer, but also Wade. I've got, you'll notice as we go through these comic books, I really like Wade as a comic book writer. His Fantastic Four run is one of the best comic book runs in my opinion, really. Um, and, and what you'll notice is most of these that I purchased from Marvel kind of started from the Avengers Disassembled and went all the way up through the new Infinity arc, if you will. So uh, that kind of encapsulated a lot of the, the House of M, um, Civil War, a lot of the stuff that's kind of covered in the movies. I, I wanted to kind of make a, an effort of walking through all the new Avengers and Avengers run of that. I've got stuff, everything from Planet Hulk, I, I spent some time getting a lot of the uh, Rick Remender runs, too. You'll notice that I'm a huge Rick Remender fan. So I've got a lot of the Uncanny X-Men here. And then Jeff Johns is probably one of my favorite comic book authors of all times. Uh, I don't have his run. We'll get to it when we get there. But you'll notice I have a bunch of his stuff. I, I, it's kind of covered by my guitar case over here, but I've got the Green Lantern omnibuses over here. 
And then over here we've got Spider-Man Maximum Carnage. This is one of the first comic books I picked up uh, as a young lad. I want to say in the 90s. I think this was published in... Looks like first printing was 94. So definitely some older... Um, in terms of my life of when I was able to purchase and have money uh, collections as I, I was trying to get the Maximum Carnage series and I never was able to get all of them. I was obsessed with Carnage as a young boy. Uh, his insanity was a nice flip side, I felt like, to Spider-Man and, and Venom being the mediation between the two. It's kind of the, the two sides of the coin. I like the way this was presented a lot better than like Two-Face ever did in kind of like the uh, DC comics that never really resonated with me. But Spider-Man was always something special. And then we have some Jonathan Hickman stuff in terms of Fantastic Four, uh, his East-West image comic run. In terms of Age of Ultron, Ultron has always been one of my favorite characters. I actually don't think this is one of Brian Michael Bendis' best runs, but what made Ultron so interesting to me is he is a creation, right? And there was a, an arc where he tried to get a bride, there was an arc where um, he's kind of obsessed with his creator in the same way that he's kind of like man, if you will. If you believe in the Bible, man was created by God. But he had this obsession with his creators and this obsession with being human, having a wife, having kids, I think, was, was even in one arc. What made Ultron unique was his struggle with his identity. And I think that got kind of lost in this as well as uh, they touched on it in the movie. I don't think it was a problem with Whedon understanding it. I think it's a problem with the medium and having enough time to really explore that concept. And then up top here, probably can't see it, but we have the uh, pocketbook Lord of the Rings collection. Um, very, very small print. Not good for old man eyes, I'll tell you that. All right, coming over here to our second collection, um, I've got Blankets by Craig Thompson. Award-winning uh, graphic novel. Really, really enjoyed that. Obviously, Astonishing X-Men by Joss Whedon. One of the best runs in comic book history. If you have never checked out Astonishing X-Men, uh, you are missing out because this is something where, I think this is the series where there was like um, a run where they didn't talk, uh, some of the twists with characters that are good versus evil. Um, there's just there's just a lot to enjoy with this series. I, I'd really recommend anyone that's getting into comics to maybe even start with this one. And then I got a lot of my classic Thanos collection over here in terms of like the Silver Surfer, Silver, uh, Surfer with the rebirth of Thanos. We've got Infinity Gauntlet, Infinity War. Thanos is my favorite villain of all time. I think you guys have heard me talk about him and, and, uh, and not just for comics, I mean villains of all time. Th Thanos is definitely my hero, and those are those are special in my heart. I did start collecting some of the Ultimate series in terms of the Ultimates and the Ultimate Spider-Mans. These just never really resonated with me the way I think the traditional Silver or Golden Age stuff did. I have some sales books here in terms of Jeff Gittimer. Um, I, some of you may know that I've run my own business for a while. Um, sold it, don't really do it anymore. Not interested in doing that. Uh, more interested in my family at this point in time, but um, obviously I'm going to have a couple of business books in here. Um, Inuyasha, not really the biggest fan. I liked, I like the anime, but I'm not a fan of the manga. And then I've got the first, uh, Thrawn, well, the, the remake of the new Thrawn book. And when this came out, boy, did the art look incredible. I just, I just really like the way this Thrawn poster looked. Um, I think it's kind of a gorgeous painting. And the story's incredible, actually. This is, this is the best of the new trilogy, in my opinion, was the first one. That's, that's what hit home. You'll see some philosophy books. This is kind of out of place, but I've got Why We Lie by David Livingston Smith. I actually don't recommend this because it's very unacademic. He admits even some of the deductive or inductive logic that he uses in this. Um, and unfortunately, that kind of killed it a little bit for me, but it was still an interesting read. I haven't read this probably in a couple decades, but I've got the original Thrawn trilogy. Any Star Wars fan would be incomplete without it. Uh, some more chess books. And down here, um, The New X-Men by Grant Morrison, probably one of the best runs in X-Men history. I know I said that about Astonishing X-Men, but these two together... Actually, no, this is the one with the silent uh, issue in there that, that really left a mark on me. Uh, Mark Miller's Wolverine, pretty decent. Parts of it better than the other. Uh, and then we have, I got a lot of my Fantastic Four. For those of you that didn't know the fact that the Fantastic Four, the way that they're kind of a dysfunctional family, they're not perfect. Their issues are their internal struggles, more so than their struggles with supervillains. And that just really, really resonates with me um, as a person. You, even before I had, you know, a family, this this was kind of important stuff to me. The ultimate stuff's not so great, but this this Fantastic Four right here. You guys heard me talk about Mark Wade earlier. 
This run is just one of the most gorgeous, gorgeous printings ever. And the storyline of this is incredible. Um, if I were to pick what comic is probably most underappreciated, it would be the Mark Wade run of of Fantastic Four. This is this is one of my favorites. All right, moving on, we have uh, just some more individual comics and stuff like that over here. I think I have some base books. We've got the Infinity Arc. Obviously, you can tell these aren't in any type of order. It's almost right next to Avengers Disassembled, almost like a whole decade of issues missing in between these that you saw earlier. Um, you heard me talking earlier about Rick Remender, uh, the Deadly Class series. Incredible. Uh, if I had to pick one comic that's my favorite comic of all time, uh, I would probably either pick Deadly Class or Chew. Just just really, really good. Age of Apocalypse, a, a definite classic. And then we've got some more of the, the issues that kind of fill in between Avengers and Civil Infinity. Just out of order over here. Everything from, um, you know, the Annihilation series out in space with Nova and all them. Uh, really, really enjoyed that series. Of notable things to point out, and I do have some more classic stuff, such as the original Fantastic Four stuff from John Byrne. And then here's the Jeff Johns Flash series that I was talking about earlier. While this won't take top place, this can't beat Chu or Deadly Class in my opinion, the Flash run by Jeff Johns is definitely something that is worth checking out. Uh, the relationship and things that he goes through uh, with Linda in this, I believe it is. Been a while since I've read it. Definitely remarkable. Um, and then we've got some phalanx, the the McFarland, Amazing Spider-Man, stuff that you know a lot of fans that are really into to comics might have. And then a few more one-off, New Avengers, Miss Marvel stuff. And uh, of course you can't forget the Brubaker, Captain America run. That was, that's a great run too, is the Brubaker series. He's got a great run. I talked with uh, Jen from Remember Reads about it. Really just recommend checking out Brubaker, I think. Um, and she's got some different opinions on it too. I'm gonna zoom out a bit for this one just because of how big this shelf is. Um, I, I do put some books up vertically in front of other books just to kind of protect them from sun damage. The, the, the light to this room is right over there. But um, we're, gonna, we're gonna finish up with some comics, some manga and light novels. And you'll actually, this, this is probably the surprising part. I, I don't have many shelves of, of literary fiction. I, I tend to check that out from the library. Um, and also I just haven't purchased a ton. It tends to be stuff that I just kind of pick up here and there, which is why I say this, this tour was probably gonna be pretty shocking for most of you. But I've got both of the um, Vertigo Sandman runs. Um, you'll see that it has kind of like the black printed um, edges there. This is definitely one of those classics that's worth checking out and is worth kind of talking about. I think we could actually probably, I mean, anything by Gaiman I think is pretty intelligent and I've talked about him in tags before. We could probably break this one down on our channel and I think that would be uh, an appropriate use. In terms of other comics that I have down here, I have the first three Saga hardcovers, love Saga, Brian K. Vaughn, amazing writer, and along with Brian K. Vaughn's um, other stuff, I have the last, why the last man right next to it over here. Um, here I have some of my literary reference stuff. Uh, if someone asked me what's the number one book to pick up, if you didn't study literature in college or take any classes for that matter, uh, this is a really approachable book, and I think he makes it fun enough, the How to Read Literature Like a Professor by Thomas C. Foster. It's really only covering mostly symbology and interpretive ways of breaking down uh, literature. It doesn't go into like historical analysis or religious uh, studies and stuff like that that we kind of go through in our channel, but this is a great intro for someone looking to dip and understand a little bit more. And then I picked up these from like the library for like a dollar, Flannery O'Connor, Hemingway, Steinbeck. Uh, they're okay. I, I wouldn't spend any money on them. Um, I think usually academic just literature in terms of like one-off papers tend to be a little bit better. We've got uh, on this shelf, if I move some of these out of the way, Shakespeare's Complete Works, Language Instinct by Steven Pinker. But I've got Low, again, continuing my Rick Remender obsession with things. And I've got the, they've actually just been recently reprinting these well, real quick, also this guy's worth mentioning is Darwin Cook. Uh, great artist, great author. Wife got that me for my birthday, but they've just recently been reprinting the Berserk run in this gigantic, uh, I think it's 7 by 10 I'd have to look it up, reprinting, which I think helps out because if you've, if you've if you followed Kintaro Miura's, uh, you know, stuff before, it's, first of all, it's brutal. It's not for everyone. I'm not recommending this for everyone. This is definitely violent. Um, but it's very detailed, almost like Akita, if you've read that. 
And in order to really do justice, you need like an oversized printing, not the original small little, what are they, four by six usually. I, these are awesome and, and I think worth it really. And then I've got some of my NYRB collection here. Um, everything from more of the, of the foreign stuff that I, I would like to get into some of these as, as you know, the channel evolves and as we're able to go into more things. Uh, Black Spider, kind of a, a really good horror piece. Um, and these are some really fun tales that, that Kenji uh, Miyazawa, he's got some really fun tales in here too, which I would need to study and learn a little bit more about Japanese folklore to feel comfortable doing that on the channel. But it's definitely something that I want to get more, more our channel towards in the future. Uh, I got some more of the Tolstoy, you know, the Cossacks, Childhood, Boyhood trilogy. I got Russian stories, pocketbooks, East of Eden, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Greatest Stories, uh, Leo Tolstoy's Confession, uh, a lot of great Russian, Russian literature here. Now, moving up to this section, and I'll jump over here real quick, too, as we do this. But uh, I've got some more of Rick Remender's Black Science Collection. Um, I've read these on comics, so I still have the wrappings on both of these, but I wanted to have the oversized print one day when I go through them again. I got the entire Death Note collection, FLCL, Penguin, Penguin Highway, Boogie Pop. I did one Boogie Pop on this channel, but I just, I don't think it got the best reception. Still figuring out how Japanese literature is going to fit into this channel. Uh, but I've got Your Name, Osmanga Dayo, and then some more uh, literature stuff. Um, Every, Everybody Behaves Badly, which is about... Uh, uh, Hemingway's first first novel. We've got uh, the Ernest uh, Ernest's Way, which was written by his granddaughter. I want to say that kind of recounts some of his journeys, uh, and then some more religious things in terms of Darwin's Black Box and the moral landscape, which talk about do we need religion to have morals and the argument for why my God ought to exist. All right, so hopping out of the way real quick, I can go through some of the box sets that I've purchased. I've got one piece, uh, all three box sets, so it kind of covers up. I haven't finished reading them all, um, but it, I think I'm up to Thriller Bark just personally. Uh, I got Bakuman, which I, he's the guy that did Death Note, so I had to get that, obviously. The original Green Lantern run. And then I've got some of the Monogatari, the Silent Vo Voice series, um, which if you haven't checked this out, this is definitely worth checking out. There's a, a very good movie that got good reception that's put on it. That's kind of dealing with a um, deaf girl that is bullied in school. And then the bully wants to repent, if you will, for what he did to her. He feels bad. He's, he's had some of that happen to him. And it's his struggles of, uh, you know, his, his reactions with his, with his classmates. Good, good story. Then a bunch of the classics in terms of uh, Huckleberry Finn, Richard Dawkins, Stephen Pinker, War and Peace in a three-box collection right up here. And then some more of my wife's literature on this side. She's still re rebuilding it after the move. Now coming up to over here, this is actually more of the literature stuff that I think you guys would have expected my entire library to be. Oh, I guess I should mention this real quick. Um, Irredeemable. This is an interesting run from uh, Boom, I believe it was. Is it Boom? Yeah, it's Boom. If you saw um, Brightburn with a villain kind of, what if Superman were bad? Um, this kind of explores that concept, too. Uh, and I got a nice oversized printing of it, which is nice. Up here, we've got more of the literature that you guys would most likely be expecting. Um, here is some more of my Plato collection in terms of, of uh, some of the Penguin classics, as well as Everyman's Library with the Republic, a uh, classic one, Symposium and Phaedrus. Uh, definitely influential on a young Una. I actually don't know if, if old Una would respond to it as well. Um, I know I'm going to go through a lot of uh, Aristotle here soon in his poetics with our breakdown of Absalom, Absalom. I haven't really found a place where to bring Plato in yet, but I definitely enjoyed reading that as a young man. We've got Virgil, John Armstrong. Um, this was a very influential book on me as young Una, Conditions of Love. Uh, this is a ph philosophical book that I don't think will change most people's minds, but young Una uh, definitely appreciated this to understand that love wasn't just an internal thing to just me, but it was a, a relationship in how I relate outwardly more so than how people outwardly related to me. I I'm not explaining that well, but this really redefined how I pictured love in my life. And, I, and, I, and this is important for, for my marriage, uh, too, for how I viewed some things. I've got things from H.G. Wells. 
Of course, I've got the, the Prince Machiavelli, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, Leo Tolstoy's Complete Collection. I got a couple of Kierkegaard. This is actually the book that I'd recommend for people if they're like, hey, I'm trying to get into Kierkegaard, what to start with, Kierkegaard for Beginners. Uh, very, very good. And after that, not Goethe, uh, I would go actually into the Sickness, ah, sorry, the Sickness Unto Death, followed by Fear and Trembling. Kierkegaard is not easy to follow or get into, but he's definitely uh, one of the more influential philosophers that have been important to me and how I do some of my breakdowns. Uh, particularly when it comes to existentialism, he's been important for me to how to interpret some some characters' actions um, in books. And we got a uh, Brave New World. I got a couple of Kurt Vonnegut works here. Just just three novels physically in terms of the the well loved um, Slaughterhouse Five, my favorite book of all time. Breakfast of Champions, which I <laughs> failed to get through. I've actually never finished this novel, unfortunately. And I just picked this up from the library before uh, before the quarantine, uh, Dead, Eye, Dead Eye Dick. So I'm looking forward to checking that out. I've got about six or seven of his works on the Kindle. So most of my Vonnegut collections Kindle only, unfortunately. And then we've got, you know, Charles Darwin, Origin of Species. Uh, Guy de Maupassant's Collected Stories. Haven't gotten through that really yet at all. One-off things such as Choke, Palahniuk. Not a fan of that author at all. It was bought for me. Judge me if you want. I don't care. Um, Rebel Without a Crew, which is kind of on filmmaking. Communist Manifesto, a political philosophy book. And then my other Kurt Vonnegut book that I have, of course, is his collected short stories. Absolutely worth the money. Over a thousand pages, I want to say, in this. And um, we're obviously going to be going through Kurt Vonnegut a lot next year on this channel. But I've got um, a lot of my Everyman collection up here. And what I'll probably do is do a one-off video specifically on Everyman, because Everyman's my favorite publisher. But I've got things from like Leo Tolstoy's Collected Stories, Roald Dahl, Somerset Maugham, Kipling, Hemingway, Fitzgerald, a lot of great stuff up here. And then we're going to move over into my Faulkner collection, which I think is what most people uh, know my obsession with is I've got my Hemingway stuff here, Old Man and the Sea, Movable Feast, For Whom the Bell Tolls. And uh, then I've got a lot of actually of the uh, modern library's printings of Faulkner from uh, Light in August, Sound and the Fury, As I Lay Dying. Um, these are probably a good, at least a decade old, maybe 15 years old um, from when I purchased these. Uh, these have been well loved and I'm loving them again now as we're kind of going through them again for this channel. And doing the, the breakdowns the way that we do has really helped me open up even further uh, my love for Faulkner is going through those. Daredevil, the Frank Miller run, classic, have to have this. We see we've got Moby Dick, Brothers Karamazov, Yukio Mishima's The uh, Temple of the Golden Pavilion, and Spring Snow. Uh, both of these I would like to go through on the channel. I know I've been talking about going through these. Uh, this is, of course, a series. But The Temple of the Golden Pavilion, uh, for those of you that didn't know, this is where, um, just outside of this, I was going to propose to my wife, actually, at the Golden Pavilion, but it was, like, way too touristy and crowded. There's a temple uh, just kind of next door, a shrine next door, and that's actually where I proposed to my wife. Um, but I do want to go through this story, a story about obsession, really, at some point in time. Uh, I think it'll be worth it. I just got to work out the scheduling with crypto, and I'm still figuring out how Japanese literature exactly fits in on this channel, but this will be coming. We have to have to have a, a highlight on Seamus Haney's translation of Beowulf. This is the best translation of Beowulf, in my opinion. The first, the first word. I love this. So, period. And there's like a three-page explanation of why he translated it to just so. But uh, he's got, you know, obviously the English translation on one side and the original text on the other. Definitely worth money if you're ever studying Beowulf to pick this up because I think this is a truly great story. And then I probably have six or seven Easton Press books. I'll get three down here for you right now. Here's Faust by, by Girta. And they have the, the beautiful, you know, cause I spent a little bit more money to get these translations. Uh, but they're definitely high quality and worth it. Uh, if you ever get a chance to uh, check these out. The camera's actually upside down for how I see it, so if I'm going the wrong way constantly, that's why. Uh, the Paradise Lost by John Milton. Obviously, you guys hear me refer to the Milton, uh, Miltonian devil several times. Um, this has just got a wonderful, wonderful translation, um, and it also have several pictures in it, too. So you can see kind of the beautiful coverings there. Great spines. And here is the 
Divine Comedy by Dante. Obviously one of the more thicker ones in terms of uh, all these cantos, but you'll see this has some beautiful imagery in it as well. I, I really like the Easton Press. I think they look beautiful, particularly when lined up here. Their spines are are uh, definitely give it kind of more of a vintage look. I definitely look forward to collecting more, but it's not something that I tend to go out of my way too much. I do spend more for hard covers, as you guys have probably noticed going through this collection. It's been a lot of hard covers because if I'm going to spend money, I'd like to to keep it and be able to pass it down to my son one day. Though I doubt he'll he'll be into literature. Maybe maybe one day I will teach him to to come on to our YouTube channel <laughs> and do some of the stuff. But he's four, so he's got some time before we got to worry about that. So that was kind of a very quick version of our uh, library tour here. I know I didn't go into every single one in super detail, but I don't think that you guys would be interested in that. If there's something you see you want me to talk more about on this library tour, like I know I want to do a video specifically on my Everyman collection because I, I think that, that, that company's just got it together in terms of the feel, in terms of the dimensions, in terms of the spine, the ribbon, everything about that company I'm, I'm in. And uh, the cl obviously the classic literature selection for them is, is fantastic. But if there's something you would like to see me cover more, it doesn't have to just be a library tour. If you'd like to be like, hey, I'd like to see a breakdown of that book, or I have that and would, you know, would love to hear your guys' opinion of it, uh, feel free to leave that in the comments below. Uh, part of this was just to kind of, I think when you do a lot of literature discussions like we do here, people might think that we're not really into, I think, some of the more science fiction, uh, obviously the comic book, graphic novel stuff. And we've been in this little guy's room the whole time. So thank you to Shadow for allowing us to come into his room, which also acts as my library uh, for this. But um, if you guys would like to see us break down any of these, uh, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts of what you guys are interested in, and, and we can definitely look at, at kind of prioritizing that. So. With that, guys, Una out.